Under the previous order, the Senate will resume consideration of S-679, which the clerk will report. Calendar number 75, S-679, a bill to reduce the number of executive positions subject to Senate confirmation. The Senator from Utah is recognized. Madam President, I'm not... Uh, well, all right, Madam President, uh, <clears throat> I'd be happy to be interrupted by the managers of the bill if, uh, if they decide to come. Madam President, there have been several recent warnings of large and growing risk in global markets from the European debt crisis. If Greece defaults, which investors see as likely, and European officials are unable to agree on how to restructure Greece's debt, lack of confidence in sovereign debt could spread. Investors could run away from liabilities issued by other highly indebted Eurozone countries or even the debt of the United States. Unfortunately, the President continues his disengagement in our debt problems. The administration continues to advocate more runaway deficit spending continuing down the path towards European-style big government. Our debt-financed unsustainable debt is pushing us toward our own fiscal crisis, yet the President has failed to lead us to a sound fiscal solution. My concern about the European debt crisis is about the possible exposure of the U.S. to a European-led contagion that could lead to catastrophe in the global market for U.S. Treasury securities. The U.S. financial system has exposures to liabilities of the public sectors, the banks, and the private sectors of Greece, Portugal, Ireland, and Spain, four highly indebted Eurozone countries. The extent of the exposure is unclear, but is potentially greater than a half trillion dollars. Given the interconnectedness in global financial markets, ultimate risk exposure is dis difficult to disentangle. More importantly, I am concerned about what all this means for American taxpayers. Americans have made it crystal clear they do not want more bailouts. Madam President, let me remind you of President Obama's pledge when he signed the Dodd-Frank Banking Act into law last year, an act which, by the way, is turning out to be a job killer and is itself a threat to our financial markets. The President clearly stated, quote, there will be no more tax-funded bailouts, period, unquote. Unfortunately, that promise has proven hollow. Recall that a Democrat-led Congress urged on by President Obama upped the U.S. ante with the International Monetary Fund in 2009. Annual funding of up to $108 billion was provided to the IMF, which can now be used to bail out profligate European governments. Make no mistake, bailouts are continuing, and there are threats of even more on the horizon. Madam President, let me be clear now. Before any crisis hits, there can be no further bailouts of banks or foreign countries or private com companies or unions or states that are funded by innocent American taxpayers. The people of Utah, whom I represent, and the vast majority of Americans want to hold the President to his promise. They are done with taxpayer-funded bailouts. The administration and the agencies responsible for the oversight of our financial system need to bring some sunshine to this situation and make clear to the American people just what the bailout risk is from the Eurozone or anywhere else. I'm proud to co-sponsor with Senator DeMitt and several of my colleagues an amendment that will roll back the funding provided to the IMF in 2009. To make the President's pledge of no more tax-funded bailouts meaningful and to do what the American people are clearly demanding of Congress, it is imperative to protect taxpayers from bailouts of profligate European countries through the IMF. American taxpayers deserve assurance now that they will not be again forced to assume risks and losses that they did not create. Taxpayers deserve to know that they will be protected from future bailouts. That is precisely what the amendment I am co-sponsoring will do. It is a simple amendment and its message is clear. No more taxpayer bailouts. If the President is unwilling to fulfill his pledge on his own, there are those of us in Congress who are happy to hold him to his word. 
I urge my colleagues to stand up for taxpayers and vote for this critical amendment. Now, Mr. Madam President, so far I have been speaking about this administration's abuse of power with regard to the IMF. I'd like to switch gears for a few minutes and talk about another series of abuses that are no less outrageous. I'm speaking about the Obama administration's labor agenda. Over the last month or so, many in this chamber have expressed concern about the National Labor Relations Board's complaint against Boeing. That complaint has been almost universally criticized, if not outright condemned, from all corners of the country. Just last week, the Washington Post, not exactly known for having an anti-union bias, had some harsh words for the board's case against Boeing. I'd like unanimous consent to have the Post's editorial entered into the record at this point. So ordered. Also, last week, the NLRB released a notice of proposed rulemaking aiming to drastically reduce the time between the filing of a union election petition and the vote to certify the union. The motivation behind this proposal is simple. The less notice the employers have regarding a union election, the less time they'll have to make their case to their own workforce. Unions and their democratic allies have sought these kinds of so-called reforms, in quotes, for decades. I want to be clear. For all of their talk about representing the little guy and standing for the people, these, these, these so-called, quote, reforms, unquote, are an affront to the spirit of democracy. They show disrespect for employees by attempting to deny them critical information that could inform their choices in these elections. Their genesis is not in a concern for the common man, but in the unholy alliance between union apparatchiks who want to grow their power and union dues and the latte left that depend on those dues to elect representatives who have little in common with the workers whose paycheck, paychecks get docked to elect them. Unfortunately, now that President Obama has packed the NLRB with former union lawyers, they look poised to get these rules. Let's be clear. This is a win for union bosses, but it is a big loss for the workers they purport to represent. I have much more to say about the NLRB in the coming days, but today I want to focus on another runaway Obama agency that is setting aside established rules and procedures in order to pay back the President's union supporters. The National Mediation Board, which has jurisdiction over labor relations in the railroad and airline industries, has, like the NLRB, aggressively pursued a unionization at all costs agenda. While the NMB's activities have not rece received the same attention as those of the NLRB, their actions are every bit as egregious. Last summer, the NMB, at the behest of big labor, changed the voting procedures for all union elections under its jurisdiction. For 75 years, an airline or railroad union had to win the support of a majority of the entire workforce in order to be, in order to be certified as the representative. Under that system, workers who did not vote in an election were counted as no votes. The logic of this rule was sound. Unions don't seek to represent just the workers that vote in an election. A union claims to represent the entire workforce. The established rule ensured that the results of an election accurately reflected the will of a true majority of a given workforce. Unfortunately, logic and common sense often stand in the way of the big labor agenda. So in 2010, the NMB unilaterally changed the rule to lower the bar. Now these elections are decided by a majority of those voting in an election, regardless of how many workers actually voted. In other words, under the new rule, a union could be certified even if a majority of the workers didn't support it. Given the timing of this election, one can only conclude that the pro-union uh, appointees on the NMB were specifically targeting Delta Airlines for unionization after its merger with Northwest Airlines. I think it would be totally naive to assume otherwise. But here's the remarkable thing. The stage was set for a union cakewalk. Shortly after the NMB fixed the rules to secure a pro-union outcome, there was an election among Delta's flight attendants to determine if they wanted to be represented by the Association of Flight Attendants, or AFA. All the rails were greased for the union, and the union still lost. The result was a triumph of employees over the union bosses. The employees had three options. One, voting yes to certify AFA representation. 
Two, voting no to reject certification. Or three, writing in an alternative choice for a representation. The NMB did its best to fix this for the union. They counted the write-in votes, votes clearly supporting an option other than the AFA as votes in favor of the union. But when the dust settled, with 94% of Delta's flight attendants voting in the election, the union still lost. Of course, the unions cried foul and have challenged those results. The NMB, which has shown little desire thus far to vindicate the rights of the non-union workers, let alone those of employers, is, a, is currently investigating the AFA's claims that Delta interfered in the vote. I think we can guess how this investigation will turn out. This recent election was not the only setback the unions have received at the hands of the Delta employees. Last fall, three other Delta workforces, the ticket agents, the bagging agents, and the reservation agents all held separate union elections, all of which ended with similar, similar results. The NMB is also investigating claims of interference in those elections, even though no substantive evidence has been presented. With these latter three elections, the union suitor was the International Association of Machinists, the same union whose interests the NLRB is serving with its absurd complaint against Boeing. If the Obama administration's commitment to serving IAM is consistent between agencies, and there's absolutely no reason to assume otherwise, I think we can predict just how those investigations will turn out. There is no time limit on the NMB's investigations. Delta has no way of knowing whether it is in the clear or whether it needs to prepare for more elections. More importantly, Delta's workers who have repeatedly rejected unionization will likely see no end to the bothersome pressure that comes with union election campaigns. I think it's safe to say that with the Obama NMB in charge, the number of union elections among Delta employees will be limited only by the time it takes for the unions to finally win one. The NMB is behaving like the bureaucratic equivalent of the, soc of the scorer's table at the 1972 men's basketball gold medal game. They are going to give the unions as many chances as they need to win this fight. Labor law and policy plays an important role in our economy. In many respects, it determines which businesses will succeed and which will fail. It plays a significant role in decisions as to whether companies should invest in the U.S. or somewhere else. Sadly, it has become customary to expect pendulum swings in labor law each time the White House changes hands and appoints new government officials to lead the federal executive branch and independent agencies. While this shouldn't be the case, I don't think we've ever seen the pendulum swing as far as it has under the Obama administration. Unions represent less than 8% of the private sector workforce. Yet with President Obama in office, the union's influence has been virtually immeasurable. This should not be surprising. During the 2008 campaign, President Obama addressed a gathering of members of the SEIU, probably the most powerful, politically powerful union in the country. During his speech, the president told the crowd that if he were elected, quote, we are going to paint the nation purple with SEIU, unquote. Apparently, Mr. President, this is the one campaign promise President Obama intends to keep. Madam President, I yield the floor. The senator from Wisconsin is recognized. I'd like to be allowed to speak for up to 10 minutes. Is there objection? Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. Madam President, I've been here for almost six months now, but I've been carefully watching Washington for the last 32 years while I've been running my manufacturing business in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, watching how increasingly broken Washington has become over the years. Nothing I've seen in the last six months has changed that evaluation. Washington is broken, and America is going broke. Our economy is in a coma, and people are suffering. America hungers for leadership, and it's not getting any. Not from President Obama, not from the United States Senate. We can't afford to have a broken political process. Not now. 
not while America is hurtling toward a financial crisis. Under Democratic leadership, it has been over two years since the United States Senate has passed a budget, and there is currently no markup going on in the Budget Committee to produce one. America is going bankrupt, and the Senate refuses to pass a budget. The President's budget, the one he presented several months ago, the great fanfare. Remember that? Four and a quarter inches thick, 2,400 pages long, and who knows how many thousands of man hours that document took to produce. It was going to be the solution to our fiscal problems. But it was so unserious, it would have added over $12 trillion to our nation's debt. It was so unserious. When it was voted on in the United States Senate, it lost by a vote of zero to 97. It was so unserious that not a single member of the President's own party voted for it. Instead of rolling up his shirt sleeves and personally tackling the number one problem facing this nation right from the beginning, President Obama delegated his role in sporadic negotiations to Vice President Biden. Now that those talks have broken down, the President is finally getting personally involved in this process. But what kind of process is this? A few people talking behind closed doors, far from the view of the American public? Is that the process that is going to decide the fate the fate of America's financial situation, of our financial future? Is this how the U.S. government is supposed to work? I don't think so. Of course not. Unfortunately, this has become business as usual here in Washington. As a manufacturer, I know if the process is bad, the product will be bad. Business as usual here in Washington is a bad process. Business, in usual, business as usual is bankrupting America. It must stop. America is simply too precious to subject our financial future to Washington's business as usual. Now, I'm pretty new here. I don't pretend to understand everything that makes the Senate work, or maybe more accurately, doesn't allow the Senate to work. But I do know the Senate runs on something called unanimous consent. So unless we receive some assurance from the de Democrat leadership that we will actually start addressing our budget out in the open, in the bright light of day, I will begin to object. I will begin to withhold my consent. The Senate needs to pass a budget. It shouldn't be that difficult. Families do it every day. A husband earns $40,000. A wife earns $40,000. Total family income is $80,000. That's their budget. That's what they can afford to spend. American families figure out how to live within their means. The federal government should be no different. A budget is a number. We should first pick one number and then a set of numbers that won't let America go bankrupt. So let me start the process by throwing out a number. $2.6 trillion. This is $800 billion more than we spent just 10 years ago. The $2.6 trillion, that is the amount that, the pre that President Obama, in his budget, said the federal government will receive in revenue next year. If we only spent that amount of money, we would be living within our means. What a concept, huh? If we want to spend more than $2.6 trillion, members of Congress, members of this administration, should go before congressional committees and openly justify what they want to spend, how much they want to borrow, and how much debt they are willing to pile on the backs of our children, 
our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. They should explain just how much of our children's future they are willing to mortgage. The American people deserve to be told the truth. Unless that happens, I will begin to withhold my consent. Unless there is some assurance that the Senate will take up its budget responsibilities in an open process, I will begin to object. Madam President, I note an absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Ms. Surikaka.
ask that the quorum call be dispensed with. Without uh, objection. Uh, I object.